Sports.com's original multimedia series talking all things North Jersey wrestling. This is Season 5, Episode 6, and we have a lot to talk about. I am Corey Doviak, being joined by my star-studded panel of wrestling aficionados from across North Jersey. And, Kenny, you know what I just realized? We have not played your introduction all year. We're going to talk a lot of wrestling tonight, and I just want people to get a sense of where you're coming from. So before we officially announce Kenny Sarajan as the co-host, let's listen to this. Let's not be shy. I enjoy basketball. Every time you touch the other guy, you get a free shot. I love it. I love all sports. Here, let's go late forward. Let's go rollerblading. I was actually watching basketball today, because now I, I get to go as a fan. So I enjoy basketball. My daughter played on a state sectional championship team at Pascal Hills. And i got to be honest with you, and I apologize because I'm being stupid. I love wrestling. I always love a free donut. <laughs> How about that, Kenny? Did you miss it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Kenny Sarajan, how I'm you doing? I'm so happy because, you know, now our superintendent of schools listens to the show, and I, I'm <laughs> glad that he tweets about our show, and he'll probably be happy to hear that intro. But I'm glad because we got one of the – we got tonight on the show, we got Tony Gonzalez, one of the great hardcore guys from wrestling for over 30 years. So we're we're all about hardcore tonight. Absolutely. Tony Gonzalez, the former head coach, longtime head coach at Richfield Park, and the uh, Tally Service Award winner this year uh, as awarded by the Bergen County Coaches Association. He will join us for a really a great interview. Uh, we'll uh, lift the curtain a little bit. We already taped it, so we know that he does a great job with us. But let's introduce the rest of the panel. And here's a guy who... Uh, a kid that worked hard to achieve the level that he got to. Pascag Valley head coach Tom Gallion. What's going on? Tommy. How much? How are you guys doing tonight? Everything's good. It's Wrestling Central here on the Wrestling Show, and we also welcome in uh, Bergen Catholic assistant coach, and we got a lot to talk to him about this week, too. He is. Donnie Handel. What's up, Donnie Spataro? God bless all of you. <laughs> and you know what? I don't have an intro yet. I'm still working on it. My brain is constantly turning uh, with the le- next member of our panel, but as Kenny Sarajan eloquently put it this week, he does have a new net nickname. We welcome in, if Donnie is the Pope, then we welcome in the Cardinal of Bergen County <laughs> Wrestling, Mike Atnesio. What's up, Pat? You know, like little steps. You know, we'll go with the nickname, and eventually we'll get a theme song, and, you know, you take it from there, Corey. Yes, I will uh, definitely do my best. And, Kenny, you know, it's going to be fun to have Tony Gonzalez on here because we're going to talk a little bit of the history of wrestling and his history is really so intertwined with Bergen County wrestling that it's going to be pretty cool. Yes, it is, and he's going to give us interesting perspectives. Things, you know, we like to talk issues here, and Tony gets into some of the issues about choice of top bottom, uh, the development of the sport at the quads, uh, his impact on both Donnie and Mike's life as wrestling. So it's it's fun to talk to Tony. He's a good guy. Yes, and Mike, you were the guy who hooked us up with Tony. Was he easy? Was he an easy guest to get? I mean, was there any problems with booking him? Nah, you know, Tony, Tony's not a shy guy. He, he, once he gets talking about about wrestling and about athletics in general, you know, he, he's more than willing to get going. So, and you know what? You can tell he's a very intelligent guy, and he's got he always has a different, a little bit of a different perspective on things. Something I really respect about Tony. He's always thinking outside the box. So, I, I knew he yeah. would make a good guest. Absolutely. So, without further ado. Strap up the seatbelts here and settle in for a uh, good talk with Rich, former Richfield Park head coach Tony Gonzalez. Coach, thanks for joining us here on the Wrestling Show. Oh, thanks, uh, uh You know, we, we saw you over at the BCCA Holiday Tournament. Uh, you know, just talk about that award. We'll get into, uh, you know, some other things also. But how was it being honored in front of, uh, the you know, the, the place where you had so many good memories? Uh, it was, a, you know, it was a great feeling looking at all the uh, the wrestlers, I remember just, kids when Donnie Spataro was wrestling when I was at Emerson. When I first started true? out coaching. Donnie Spataro. Yep. How did, how did he look in a singlet? <laughs> yeah, he was, he was an awesome looker. I'll be honest with you. He looked like Tarzan, wrestled like Jane. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he was hot. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I, I say again, Coach, welcome to the wrestling show. It seems like you fit, in right, fit right in around here. All right. <laughs> Did you ever see Kenny Sarajan in his thing? Oh, yeah. He was, he, he was a sight for sore eyes, and I mean a sore eye. 
he was, he was, all them guys, Cara Sealing, the old days, Kenny O'Brien. Uh, those are names of throwbacks for those days. Yeah, no doubt about it. Go ahead, Ant. Hi, Tony. Let's, I want to talk about a lot of different things with you, but, you know, one of the things that we talk about from time to time is, you know, how the sport has changed over the years. And, of course, we talk sometimes about sports specialization. And I feel like you're one of the guys I think of when I think of the, of the really great connection between football and wrestling. And I think when your program was at its height, you had so many good linemen that were part of so many great football teams you had that just were your whole upper weights, you know, that, that made up your upper weights on your wrestling team. Talk about the connection a little bit and, and how you got those guys to do both sports year after year. Um, the most important thing that I want people to understand is that the mental toughness, the grueling routine that you pick up in wrestling makes you a better football player. Too many coaches are too many times telling kids about cutting weight, you know, focus on one thing. And I'm telling you that the years we won the state sectional titles and went to the finals, those were the years we didn't lose in Bergen County except to Emerson the third year uh, up at Apacon. And uh, football players, if you look at the history of football wrestling, you'll see guys like Dave Zott, Tony Saragusa, state champs, uh, Damian Covington, yeah, even today you look at them. They're the better athletes on the team in the critical positions, running back, linebackers. If you don't wrestle and combine it with football, you're not going to reach your maximum potential. Wrestling just make, puts that mental toughness and that cut up. And I've always said this. I love coaching football. I respect coaching wrestlers, even from the average kid to the great kid. What they put themselves through between dieting, between wrestling, between between dedication, and not only sacrifices during Christmas. See, people miss that whole thing. While everyone's out there having fun, the wrestler's cutting the weight, and he's maintaining that mental discipline. And it carries over into life skills. That's the important part. Yeah, that's well said, too. I thought Kenny Sarajo was going to jump in with the Kevin Wilkins, but, you know, that's his favorite all-time wrestler. Yeah, well, we Go talk ahead, about Kevin Wilkins. We talk about football. We talk about all of them. Hey, Tony, you know, how I can only imagine the drain on you, though. I mean, a head coach of two major sports at a very sports-conscious school, what was it like to go to manage two uh, primary sports at Richfield Park, to, you know, the summer work you had to do with both football and wrestling and then go from football into wrestling. What about for you as a coach? Well, basically, it was always the same kids carrying over. The football players went to wrestle, and then after wrestling, we went to baseball. And if you remember, a couple of 95 and 96, we also went to the county semifinals when we beat Paramus and we lost to Ramapo. And we were a group two school. As a matter of fact, like if you look historically back, I think we played stiff out of overall schools and the highest group one and two school when my brother was wrestling and our teams, you know, did really well in the county tournament. And then everybody started, okay, you're group one champ, you're group two champ, you're group three, and they recognized that. But the point being is that uh, when you go from, I was, as a kid, my coach told me, hey, you're playing football, you have to do a sport to get better as an athlete. And then the spring, how to do something to get better. So I did the whole gamut. My body, my entire life since I was 16 years old, I was going through three sport phases. But without question, I became a great running back from an average running back because of my junior year going to wrestle. I was a basketball player for two years. And that, that, that carryover is unbelievable. Kenny's a big basketball fan. I mean, the, the right, Ken? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, hey, Tony, Kenny, uh, Tony just said that wrestling carries over the life skills. Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, Ken, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> Ken fell in love with taking pictures. Kenny's in his boxers. Donnie, you got to, go ahead, give one to the coach. I mean, he he give you a zinger. Feel free to hit him with a zinger and then a close. No, that's okay. Uh, no, it's fine. Listen, no, Tony, 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 here's, here's, a question. There, right? Tony here, here's a question for you. When you first started out coaching and wrestling, uh, what what year was that? 
your first year coach. 1981 in Paramus, and I was a freshman coach when Joe Savino first took over. And okay. And wow. myself and Kenny MacGyver. What's the Paramus. biggest differences now that you see from when you first started to, say, wrestling today? What stands out? Like a, when you when you watch it today, it's and you say to yourself, "Wow!" You know, thinking back to 1981, you know, what what the, what's the big big things, the big differences that stand out with today's wrestlers versus years ago? And more, don't say the parochial schools take all the good kids. We we've been over that. No, there's more emphasis on any level at any school put on takedowns. Where it's and I did my masters on this, a study of who wins more often by choice selection in the second period. And it came up that when you took a uh, top, there was a significant correlation between winning more often than picking bottom, top, neutral. But here's the thing, though, that the coach's bias played a big part into it. And the two major differences, kids would never, in, back in the 80s, take down. They always took the offensive position, and it wasn't so much uh, takedowns. It was more of a pinning and, and riding, and those are the two biggest changes that have happened. And uh, I think that that the team that's going to spend more time on top will have two periods down because they'll defer. The other kid's going to take down because the coach is biased. It's the way people started coaching uh, that changed the whole philosophy of taking top and trying to pin the guy. But a great, great thing they did was to get rid of riding time because it was just like a two-to-one watching paint dry on a wall. You know, two to one matches, three to two matches, four three. Now there's a lot more pinning, and especially like the school people are pinning off the takedown when you're off balance. That's a great point. That's one we haven't heard here. Uh, 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 real analysis and research on uh, wrestling positions. That's a good one. Tommy, what do you got? Um, well, I want to uh, kind of piggyback what Kenny said. So when you were head football and head wrestling, how did you manage, you know, when, you're, when you had very successful fo- football teams? And it carried into wrestling season. You know, did you practice? Did your wrestling practice start, you know, late at night? Did you let your assistants? Like, how were you able to to manage both of those at the same at the same time when you were in the state playoffs for football? You know, just seems well. The, big, guys the biggest thing, guys. thing was I I scheduled our tournaments are scheduled uh, at Richfield Park December naturally the, the Garfield tournament or the Bergen County Coaches Tour. Then we would go to Elizabeth because it would take time for our football players to catch up, and then we didn't want it to affect the team. So we tried to go to four tournaments and, you know, as soon as we could and then bring the team together because kids were banged up from football and everything like that. So we bought some time in that sense, and that's how we did that crossover. As far as how I did it was when I was in football, I started the rec wrestling in Mitchell Park, and I would do that. And then after wrestling started at night, I would do the rec wrestling. And then we, we pass it on, but it was always you were always putting a lot of time in getting home eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. But you had to put the time in because if you don't, no one, no one else is gonna. And plus, Richard Park, you had to remember something. Wrestling was just a, a sport of you know ten guys. It wasn't. We weren't. Now we're getting parents who wrestled at our program, like Von Rutenberg was on the state championship team, Scalo. Uh, we're getting, um, uh, you know, a lot of guys that wrestled are now coming back to the program and their kids are wrestling, but we didn't have parents to run the wreck, and that's where we differed everywhere else. Tommy, let me ask you a question. You, you, you had a career that goes back, and we were young coaches together traveling to Princeton and having fun, but, but let me ask you, Tony, what, what in all those years is your most memorable wrestling match as a coach? As a match or as, you know, as an individual, because most memorable was when my brother lost at Princeton on uh, the first takedown. And as, yeah, give us both. Okay, I, that match really hurt me because uh, I didn't let go of that match because we could have uh, done two things different in that match that would have put Pete in that situation. Um, but we weren't adverse at the techniques of stalling the way, you know, Bridgewater Rarington you know, the way the kid worked the edge and all that kind of stuff. So we could have circled and brought him back inside. But the other thing was... As his last, his was, last name was uh, Widmer. Yeah. I think something happened to him in college. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Widmer, yes. Bridgewater Rarington. Because I was looking forward to whether my brother got his butt whooped or not was to him wrestle Milky or 
you know, that was going to be a big showdown. And uh, as a team, I think the most memorable was uh, our first league championship when um, we were up at Cliffside and we were wrestling and uh, a couple of kids got hurt. One Baez dislocated his, his finger and he popped it back in and he finished the match. And then uh, I think it was Skylar or Black pinned to seal the match and the camera shaking and the bus driver runs onto the mat and starts hugging the kid. <laughs> that was that was memorable. Um, it, but but those two things stuck out. And then character wise was Rob Black getting a full Nelson put on him and he uh, he thought he never beat Kangas and he said to me that when we went out there I go, You were right? He goes, Yeah, I'm not winning that way and he went out after the injury time, it was an illegal move. He went out and he beat Rob Kangas for the first time and got athlete of the week. Wow. That's a good one. And it sounds like it's still fresh in your mind. They yeah, uh, still could, yeah. stand out there. You almost see it like, vividly, but it's the point of the, doing the right thing. Um, ironically, let me say this. When I was in high school, I was wrestling Cliffside Park, and I think I was wrestling Hanley, and I had nine pins straight, and I headlocked them, and I slammed them. And he started to get up to push me, and his coach ran on the mat and told him, you know, hey, no, no, don't worry about it. You know, take it easy. And uh, it turns out he's my athletic director today, Joe Tabe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tabe's a long time close I I always right. tease him about it. I think you stole my 10 straight 10. But, uh, <laughs> you look at, hey, uh, you got another one? Yeah, no, no plus I want to say this, is that the, the wrestling community, whether you – dislike someone or you may not agree with them, there's always that bit of respect that I didn't not remember something. I was a head baseball coach. <clears throat> I was assistant track coach. I've been around a little bit. Not just wrestling, football. And the respect that is given and, and the way the kids are with each other is a beautiful thing that you can't teach. It just comes innately in wrestling because you respect that person. They went through the grueling everything you went through, and maybe you won or maybe you lost that day, but you know you know for sure in your heart that you gave everything you had to give and then some, and so did that person. And the preparation to get there is where I say the difference is, and I hold my finger up, is about a half an inch between a champion and a winner. And the champion is willing to do what the winner stops when he stops. That's the difference. And it- that comes out in wrestling. And the other thing about wrestling, I mentioned it after the county tournament this year on the show too, is the lack of celebration uh, when you win a, you know, for better, you know, for lack of a better term, a county championship in Bergen County. I mean, you know, other sports, I know it's different because the county tournament in wrestling is so much earlier in the season, but, you know, there's barely even a handshake or a hug. The kid goes, throws the warm up on, go runs, goes and runs some laps. I mean, yeah, it's definitely you see somebody win a basketball championship and you got to clear the court, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's definitely a different vibe because, it, you know, the, the kid who won uh, just got beat up too, you know? I think it's just respect. Like, you wouldn't want a kid to yeah. say, hey, you might run and high-five your coach or jump into his arms and wrap your hands around his legs. You see that. Right. But you don't see the other stuff like pointing. You get a first down. All of a sudden, hey, you dropped three passes before that, and you, you see the kid pointing a first down. I, it's classless. And and I also think, like, for example, coaches are getting into arguments with kids, you know, players and stuff. I mean, that's you see that all the time. Now, a kid gets tackled by the sideline. Someone says something to the kid, and then there's an argument ensues. In wrestling, you go out of bounds near the other coach. The coach helps you up. You only yeah, catches yeah. you before you hit the bench or the chairs That's or whatever true. it might be. You see that. I just I just think that wrestling builds, and, I, and I, again, not cliche, it builds character, but most important, it tells you what your limitations are. If you want to know what will make you quit, do wrestling, because you will not quit anything. Go ahead, try wrestling. Go ahead, Ed. And, and Wait, the other I thing is, had... with, little kids, with little kids, people take them to ta- Taekwondo and all this other stuff, you take them to wrestling because that's going to make that discipline, that practice schedule, everything. It makes a big difference in, in, in everything that kid does growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome point, Tony. I got, I got two things for you, Tony. One is one thing you probably don't know, how you affected my career and the entire course of Westwood Wrestling because of, you know, when we wrestled each other, when I started coaching, that was your, that was your heyday. 
Whitfield Park, BCS, BCS All-American. You guys won the league a number of years in a row. And when I first came in, the first t- two times I wrestled you, we got headlocked and cradled so many times that not only did we learn how to counter the move, but it changed my approach to coaching because I realized the way we had to wrestle you changed the way that we had to approach the things that we wanted to do. And I said, you know what, this is a great way to, to change your opponent's approach to you. So that's the truth is we were known real well, and Donnie could tell you about this a lot, for having a real good slatel and for doing a great Merkel series. Merkel, so, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't really do that stuff in high school. That's not like the way I wrestled. But I actually left there, you know, I remember specifically in 1997, I said next time we wrestle these guys, they're going to have something that's kind of difficult to stop because I want to do something to take them out of their game plan. And, you know, sometimes having a home run move and something that most of your kids in your lineup are good at can change the way you wrestle a dual match. And we basically rode that for 10 or 15 years. So the way you guys had great headlocks and great cradles, it, that changed the way I coached quite a bit. And uh, that, that's something that, you know, I think you should be proud of. That your kids were so good at something that it, it changed the way we approach our matches together, you know? No, absolutely. I always tell the kids, you have to have something – a signature move that you got to hang your hat on. And the reason that we started teaching the headlock was because kids are wrestling for 8, 10 years. Our kids start as freshmen. So we had to have a home run move that would an equalizer, we call it. And then the, the other thing is that the cradle series, when I was doing my master's uh, paper thesis, I, first of all, Joe Savino is the one who did it the first time on selection in the second period. Then I took it a step further because we had the fur neutral Anyway, and what I did was, uh, I think in one match, it was 23 times a kid's knee came to his head. I mean, we got a little ridiculous because we started at the end trying to force a cross-face cradle. But the quick cur- cradle is very deadly, especially with someone who does a poor stand-up. Mm-hmm. Excellent. The other thing I want to say real quick is, Coach, I don't know if you remember this, but a long time ago, probably somewhere in those mid-90s, I remember we were at a meeting and you were saying, you know what, guys? we got to start doing these quads, three matches on one day. And, you know, this is going back. Nobody really was doing that stuff. And I remember also all kind of looking at each other going, three matches on one day? You think that's going to be a – you think people are going to want to do that? And look where we are now. Every Saturday, yeah. every Saturday. Yeah. Quad. So, Tony, you were like a visionary. You saw this stuff coming way before we all saw it coming. Yeah, thank you. I just felt that the kid was cutting away from – he goes to the match, and all of a sudden there's nobody there. He got no match yeah. for another week. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm yeah. glad that it went to quads. I, re- I really am. Quads, and then, you know, the, the Wednesday night keeps the, you know, the crowd in it and the home match or visiting match, whatever. But it, it's got to go, and it's going to turn even more to tournaments, team tournaments or individual tournaments to make sure a kid wrestles three, four times. These other mm-hmm. states, what are they getting, like 60 matches in it? Mm-hmm. 40, 50 really, yeah. yeah, it really does get you ready for tournament wrestling when every weekend you're wrestling three matches. That way, when you come to districts and regions, that's the norm. It's not something and new, that, you know? Yeah, and that's why, I, I don't know if everybody agreed to it, but I think that people, everyone started wrestling in quads, and then when the state said, hey, one day district, everybody's like, oh, man, that's great for the kids, it's great for the sport, it's great for the parents. I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're the top seed, you're most districts, not most, but some of the districts, you're getting a buy. Mm-hmm. Or you're pinning them great. Very, very rarely was there. Usually the upset runs in the death seed. The, the sixth seed usually beats, has a shot at the third seed, and the fourth and fifth have a pretty good battle. But one and two normally don't get knocked off until the semifinals. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, it's good stuff. I, w- I wasn't aware of the history. That uh, I mean, I knew you were around a long time and had great teams. I didn't realize the innovation and research that you put into it. So uh, it's great stuff and good to hear here on the wrestling show. Tony Gonzalez. Hey, thank you for having me. A great me. guest here. Yeah, we appreciate it. And uh, I think you have earned yourself a return appearance here somewhere down the road. Okay. Thank you. Bye, guys. And Donnie, I love thank you, man. You. I remember hey. when I was at Emerson, babe. <laughs> well, that was certainly interesting stuff there with Richfield Park's Tony Gonzalez and uh, Mike. A good get for this edition of the wrestling show. I'm glad it worked out. I, I, I thought he was great. Yes, and uh, we we don't even have to mention the fact that it took it took us seven times to get him to pick up the phone. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. sweet. <laughs> you know, he was building up drama. You know, 
Absolutely, and he did a good job of it. Thank you, Tony Gonzalez, for coming on. And, Kenny, let's uh, start taking a whip around here of uh, Bergen County Wrestling because this was a big week, not just Bergen County Wrestling, North Jersey Wrestling. Big matches all over the place, and you can – Go ahead. You can tell Donnie what a good job he did. Well, this is what, you know, Donnie, I give Donnie credit for this because he always says this is the second part of the season. We're in the dual meet season. And I'll tell you, you couldn't have had a more dynamic weekend. And, you know, it's good tonight we're taping it on Tuesday. And and even extending it to Monday, what a weekend. We have Burton Caffley doing a, a hell of a job against Blair. Give him a lot of credit. Hey, Donnie, I got one quick question. And Tommy and I, neither of us knew the answer, so I'm being very honest and genuine. When you guys wrestle Blair, are they allowed to use their their, their fifth-year guys, or are they only allowed to use guys who are uh, 9 through 12? Blair has a rule never to use their uh, – first of all, I don't think it's allowed, but second of all, even when they go to the prep nationals and whatnot, even though that some other teams do, Blair does not use their uh, postgraduates, the PGs. Okay. So that was that was an outstanding match. Uh, it was very close. You guys did a hell of a job. You come back uh, and you you um, throttled the Paul last night. I mean, what a match that must have been. What did you guys get? Give us a rundown of both matches really quick, Donnie. You're a quick one, though. Well, Blair came down to the second to last match. We did have a chance to win. We lost uh, a lot of the close matches. And like we always talk about on the show, if you want to be one of the best teams, and you want to beat the best teams, you got to win those close matches. And there was like two or three that were like a point difference, and uh, we didn't get those. We didn't get those matches. If we get one, one of those, we possibly win the match. Uh, I mean, I think we held our own with the number one team in the nation, and uh, we made a we made a statement for uh, the public schools in New Jersey that uh, you know we can stand up now with the uh, prep schools nationwide. The uh, Paul last night we. Uh, on paper, it really looked like it was going to be a, a tight match. And again, yeah, I know. <laughs> last, week, last week you said you know you were worried about it. Yeah, we were. Uh, the matchups looked very good on paper, and uh, going back to winning, you know, winning the tight ones. We won a lot. The first two matches, you had uh, Pete Lapari uh, beating a, uh, a state place winner from two years ago that he that he actually lost in the dual meet last year. He got the winning takedown, I think, with like about 10, 15 seconds left. Win that match by one or two. Uh, the second match was uh, a rematch from the Beast. It was uh, Shane Griffin versus one of the Key brothers, and uh, this time uh, Shane turned the tables on him. So those first two matches really set the tone for the rest of the dual meet, and you could, you could see that the kids really fed off those first two matches, especially uh, Pete Lapari's match to open, open up the match. That really fired up the team, and it seemed to steamroll from there. Donnie, how much did having wrestled at the Beast and then going out to the Doc Buchanan in California, whatever it was, last week, you know, and then you come home to face Blair, I, I, I guess at this point your kids are kind of immune to who's on the other side of the mat and they're just going out and wrestling. You, you know, it's funny. They have, they have a phrase that they use. That they just say it's just another day at the office. That's what they yep. said, and they're, and they're used to it. They really are. Instead of... Uh, you know, I mean, you have some teams that wrestle, maybe they get that one big match a year and they wrestle a top-20 team. I mean, we, we seem to, you know, wrestle a team like that w once a week. So they're used to it. It's become uh, common nature for them. I mean, even early in the day, we wrestled Long Branch. That was the 13th-ranked team in the state. And after that, then we took on Blair. So it's uh, they're getting used to it, and you can tell. And... Uh, you know, there's no firing them up. There's no big talks before the match. It's just that they're used to this type of schedule, and yeah. and it's, it's 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 you know it's paying off, and hopefully it pays off at the end of the season down in Atlantic City. Yeah, I mean that's the goal all along. All right, Tommy, you can take your head out of the puke bucket now because I want to ask you about uh, Paramus beating St. Joe's. You know, you talk about a public school and a parochial school, and uh, you know the Paramus got a good win there. Yeah, well, I mean, they got a good win against uh, St. Joe's on Wednesday, and prior to that, I mean, um, Primus wrestled. They went down to Jackson on Saturday. They wrestled Jackson Memorial. They lost by, I think it was like 10 or 12, and then they beat South Plainfield by about 5 or 6. So, again, you know, they're going out, and, um, you know, I know Steve took them to the BC this year for the first time, I think, since he's been there. Uh, they wrestled Hanover Park earlier in the year. They wrestled Bill Barton. So he, you know, I guess he's kind of, I mean, he's got the horses, so he's kind of going along with what kind of uh, 
you know, Donnie and them are doing and trying to wrestle the best to, you know, not only get his team set up for the, the team state tournament, but also, you know, try to get his individuals set up for down the road. And, and for, um, St. Joe's was just another one of those tests. And, uh, I mean, I think he beat him by about 13 last night. Um, and he got a few big wins. I know down below with some with some extra bonus points, which is what you talk about. Like Donnie was saying, they lost some close matches. Um, you know, Paramus looked to get a few extra bonus points in some of their wins, which uh, you know led him to a nice victory over St. Joe's. Absolutely, and at it seems like the you know the blueprint has been uh, sketched. So a lot of public schools are starting to follow it now. You know, it, it it's something that maybe I don't know what the Westwood plan is, but you know the, the how to do it. For a public school and for a parochial school, it, it's their kind of, you know, I think Bergen Catholic going out and being as ambitious as it has been uh, has kind of changed things around a little bit. Yeah, you know, they, they raise the bar a little bit. It definitely elevates the level of the program. But, you know, the, the timing of doing that and making the decision to wrestle those big matches is crucial because if you make the decision to do it before your program is ready, it's a disaster. You right. Know, you, have to, you have to have horses to make the, the jump to wrestle at the higher level. You can't just say, oh, you know, the key is good competition and just wrestle tough teams. If you don't have kids that are kind of close to wrestling at that level, then it's demoralizing and, and you have these one-sided matches and it can set the program back instead of going forward. Yeah, hey, that's Corey, true. It is, it is timing. Yes. I want to go back to one thing about Paramus and something Tommy said. Because uh, Steve Class has done a great job with Paramus. All he's done there is win every freaking year. And and they won a sectional and 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 you know Paramus athletically has had some turmoil and he suffered some of that and he he held his his ground and and he's proven as a winner there and you know uh, he he's gotten kids to stay there and it's interesting to watch this guy coach and when he first got there I know I was coaching with Tommy and we'd see Paramus come out and he was meticulous in the way. His kids warmed up. Everything was timed. Everything was prepped. It was very interesting to watch him as a coach. And then the other night I got to see him wrestle against Tommy's team. And, and you know, yes, they beat Tommy, and, and I understand that. And they are better, and Tommy's got a young team, so it's not about that. But it's about watching the guy coach, and it's about what you guys said about the bonus points. And the whole time as a coach, he was so instructional, and what, and he was always telling the kids, what they had to do, look, I need you to do this, let's get, and he was training them, even in a match like that, to get extra points, extra team points, so that they understood situations, so that then when they go against the Paramus, they understand when he says you got to do this, they're going to do this. I, I, my respect grows for him every time I watch him, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get Steve back on the show one time. Yes. Well, let's definitely put it in the plan. The other one that you mentioned uh, you wanted to talk about was the Bosco St. Peter's prep match. Yeah, that went to uh, uh, Criteria, and that went to Criteria uh, H, which is the most points scored first, or the first most points scored. And and that's you know what that's I, I brought up Don Bosco because I I have a question for Donnie, uh, Mike, and uh, Tommy later but the first question i want to ask donnie is and mike and tommy is can paramus take don bosco tommy i always have to i always have to tell you to please no, point know, your question right. at somebody. professional on that tommy <laughs> can paramus take don bosco um i think it's going to be close but i don't i don't know if they have uh enough to take them i mean they're, they're obviously loaded and seeing them Friday night, but I know they're still missing Sabahi. Uh, I don't know when he's back. If he's back, you know, maybe they could take him, but without him, I think they're they're just going to maybe fall a little short. I think Bosco just has a little too much. At, I have to go with, uh, you know, Tommy's point about health. It seems like Bosco is getting healthy right now, and it seems like Paramus maybe not quite there. I know they, uh, I don't know how long it's going to be, but one of their, their top upper weight, Ferrero, uh, was injury default last night with some kind of an injury. Uh, if he's not in there, that really hurts their chances. But if if he's in there and Sabahi's in there, then I'd say they have a chance. You know, I'd say that uh, Bosco edge, but chance for Anis, sure. All right, Donnie, real quick, I need three predictions from you. One. Uh -huh. one first one is Bosco DePaul. 
Tommy Donnie. No prediction. Come on. Uh, <laughs> really? That's going to be on his locker when he walks in uh, into the locker room. Hey, St. Joe's BC. Oh, okay, you don't want to do that one either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, hey, I think the Paul, that, that match is going to be a good match. Is a, there's a couple nice ma- individual matchups itself. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to predict who's going to win, who's going to lose, but I just like some of the matchups on, on both teams. It's a, That'll be a, a really good match for a fan to go to watch. Yeah, All right, you know. Boy, that was diplomatic. Yes, wow. thank you. Go out and watch. We, yeah. We've talked about parochial schools. We've talked about the larger public schools. Let's get to the, the mid to small size public schools. Mike, you guys had a tough one against Pascac Hills, and then Pascac Hills is right in the crest. This is their year, and they run into Emerson Park Ridge, and and they've got a lead, and then the the Robles brothers and Schneider put it away for Emerson Park Ridge. What do you guys see for Pascal Kills at Riverdale this week, guys? Tommy first. I think it's going to be a good match. Oh. <laughs> I'm not making Five a prediction. years we've been doing this. Now you guys go soft? Come on. I'm not making a prediction on that one. Come on now. I think I really think, I mean, watching River, wrestling Riverdale, seeing Hills the other day against Emerson, I mean, Riverdale is, you know, Mike's the only guy that, that graduates four state qualifiers and just still has just a loaded lineup. I mean, down below, he is he's as tough as anybody. Okay, so gets, do this for me then, Mike and Tommy. And, and, to, and I'll let Mike go first and Tommy come back. Instead of giving me a prediction, analyze the match. If I go to the match, what should I be watching? Mike? Well, you know, let me, let me say a few things. Since Tommy was, you know, Tommy saved a lot of words for me. I was just going to say, please do. <laughs> so, I'll give you an interesting perspective. Westwood wrestled Pascac Hills on Wednesday and Emerson on uh, on Friday, and then Emerson and Hills wrestled on Saturday. So you would think that we'd have a real good insight to how that match is going to go. If you look at the scoreboards and just look at final scores, Pascac Hills beat us convincingly. I think they doubled our points. And the Emerson match... Why I would say it was not dramatic, it was close on the scoreboard, and we were basically like, you know, if we had one guy healthy that was out, I'd say it's a nail-biter. So you would think, look, this is probably going to be the year that Hills beats Emerson. But on the scoreboard, you can't look at it like that because it's about matchups, it's about a coin toss, it's about other things. And it turns out that, you know, the way things matched up for Emerson worked out really well for Emerson that night. And... When you look at Emerson, and when you look at Pascal Hills right, matching up with Riverdale, I I think you have to look at it and go, you know what? I wouldn't take that much away from Pascal Hills just because they lost to Emerson. The matchups weren't great. They lost a couple of close ones, and like you said, Emerson has a, has a streak from you know like 13 to 52 where they they just keep putting out good guys match after match after match, and they pick up a lot of bonus points. So I think when you go see uh, Pascal Hills and Riverdale. I expect it to be a really, a really close match. And I think uh, an interesting match, I think, is going to be a heavyweight. Uh, I think it's going to be a big, you know, and the nice thing about when there's two pretty good heavyweights, none of them is bumping away. You know, they're both going heavyweight. There's no other weight class for them to go. So you right. know that the, uh, the the good heavyweight from Hills is going to wrestle the good heavyweight from from uh, from Riverdale. And that, that could be a turning point match right there. But I, I actually, I think that would be a very, very close match. I, you know, they do that thing. Who wore it better? And they show the two women in the dresses. Who wore it better? Kenny, I think Matt, uh, Mike Atanasio won. Who wore it better this week? Yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right. He, all right. he beat Tommy Gallione, who would just like to say, uh, fans, go out and watch it. I think. Well, Riverdale. I mean, Riverdale's got a lot of tough lower weights. So, you know, I, I agree with Mike. Though. I think the upper weights. You know, I think there's a lot of good matches up there. Actually, when I look at it, that's I, I look at what they both said about the heavyweight and what Bucko does between Stanley and Castrillion, because I I think you can look at through the lineup and almost say, okay, Riverdale gets this one, Hills gets this one, Riverdale gets this one, Hills gets this one. I mean, the head-to-heads of dynamite wrestlers are only in, I say, three weight classes. So I think it comes down to those three head-to-heads and then bonus points. If you really want to know that, when I looked at the weight classes, that's what I saw. I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, but yeah, you know, no, I, I think that I think it's like, you know, I, I agree. I think Riverdale is very tough down below, 
and like you said, I, I think Hills can win some. Well, it's, yeah, it's going to be the bonus points. Whether and also, the, I think it's the it, as we see in our sport of wrestling, coin toss too. It's the coin toss and where you start. It's the yep. coin toss and where you start. All right, uh, I got a question of the week. If you're ready, uh, Corey, say no more. And now it is time for the segment that is sweeping the high school wrestling world. A segment so confounding, so creative, and so calculated that it often leaves our panel speechless or pleading the fifth. It's Ken Sarajan's Coach's Question of the Week. And now okay, it's season guys. five. Ken knows to wait for the trumpet. Go okay. ahead. Okay, uh, guys, here we go. And we'll go Donnie first, then we'll go Tom, and then we'll go At because At's been the star of the show. He's our cleanup guy. Clean right. So St. Peter's and I, Don I drew, I, drew the, I drew the short straw. Go ahead. <laughs> no pun intended. No, you are the short straw. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, hey, hey uh, Kareem Abdul, relax there, Kenny. <laughs> first time in five years I get you. Let me have one moment. <laughs> All right. But, so here's here's the question of the week. St. Peter's Don Bosco goes to the eighth criteria. Guys, two part question. In dual meets during the regular season, should we let the tie stand or should we limit should we limit the number of criteria used? Go ahead, Donnie. What do you mean limit the number of criteria? Instead of I mean how many you're gonna go down to the first Point scored in the battle. We've been in situations, Tommy and I, where we would have won the match if we had forfeit a weight class because we got pinned, but they also got the first point scores. So you can game it. When you go down to eight criteria and you can control what happens by forfeiting instead of wrestling, that's not, in my mind, that's not right. So you can say, all right. Here's the here's the criteria. Most pins, most matches won, and just go three or four, and then say if we can't set, settle it after three or four, we go to the tie. So you just guess, right guess, guess what the last, number of guess, criteria. What do you think? Guess what the very last criteria is. I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. It's, a, it's a coin to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, so Donnie, what's your opinion? No, I I think it goes the criteria. I don't think a tie really settles anything anymore. I remember I remember years ago, you know, when I wrestled that there were ties and in in uh, you know actually in the dual meet match, and I remember individual ties. There was no overtime, so I kind of like it the way it is today. There's just a, a winner, and that's it. You know, I don't I don't care what criteria it goes down to. I I think a you know a winner needs to be declared. I think the coaches should wrestle. That should be the final criteria. Yeah. As, Tommy, as long as it was like a 30 second, 30 second period yeah. <laughs> that was meaningful Corey once again show how much you know about wrestling <laughs> <laughs> hey at least I know they have coaches <laughs> go ahead Tommy. Uh, I think you know I think there does need to be a winner you know regular season obviously post season um, you know so the criteria is important I mean one way of keeping it simple Kenny like you said how can we cut down the criteria is and you change the number of weight classes. Then it just goes, you, know, you drop it down to 13, this team has seven wins, this team has six wins, whatever the case may be. Whoever has more wins, ends it right there. You know, instead of going all the way down, you know, that also provides a little more depth for certain teams. But, again, um, I do like having a winner, although it's tough. I mean, we've lost a bunch on, you know, most first points scored. I think one year we lost three matches that year. So, you know, it hurts. But, again, it, you know, we've also won a few on it. As well, so I, I uh, yeah, I like the idea of having a winner. And at, I don't like the idea of uh, having matches decided based on who scored the most first points. I mean, you could make the argument that, well, the other team was better; they came back more from losing the first points. I mean, it, yeah. it seems like a really silly way to settle a tie. And to me, you don't have to settle ties in the regular season. You have to settle ties when there's advancement. To me, there's no advancement. Why not? Bosco would tie that match. Um, and, and, you know, the obvious solution is 13 weight classes or 15 weight classes. Have an odd number of weight classes so the team that won the most bounce wins. But, you know, hopefully someday we'll get there. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, 13 would uh, change. You know, we've been talking about it for a whole variety of other reasons, but that would be an uh, unintended consequences. That would make a lot of sense. Yep. But, you know, hey, Kenny, that's what we do here on the wrestling show. We make a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> How about we leave it right there, gentlemen? Good night. Follow the leader. <laughs>